I'm Roger Mark D'Souza, the Director of Population, Environmental Security and Resilience here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And I'd like to welcome you to what our boss, Jane Harmons, calls our intellectual candy shop where you can come and learn about different ideas and different perspectives, but where you don't get fat on spin. So we're going to talk about a very important topic um, in that context. As many of you know, we are a living memorial to President Wilson, and in his legacy, we bring together the worlds of analysis, policy, and practice. And this um, event today is being hosted by our Environmental Change and Security Program, which has just celebrated its uh, 20th anniversary. And we're happy to be launching, together with the Woodrow Wilson Press, the other population crisis, what governments can do about falling birth rates with the author, Stephen Philip Kramer. We are here today as part of um, our project that's being supported, our program that's being supported by USAID, which looks at the linkages between health, population, environment, livelihoods, and, and security. So I'd like to um, acknowledge and, and thank uh, USAID for their support of our ongoing series. Just um, not too long ago, on April 4th, the New York Times ran an opinion piece which was um, entitled Bye Bye Baby. And the piece started by saying nearly half of all people now live in countries where women on average give birth to fewer than 2.1 babies, the number generally required to replace both parents over their lifetimes. This is true in Melbourne and Moscow, Sao Paulo and Seoul, Tehran and Tokyo. It's not limited to the West or to rich countries. It's happening all over the world. It then went on to say that this is news to many people, and it's also a source of alarm, even hysteria, mostly in the West. In his book, What to Expect When No One's Expecting, Jonathan V. Lust, the senior writer at the Weekly Standard, described a coming demographic disaster from America's baby bust. Stephen Philip Kramer, a professor at National Defense University, says rich countries with low fertility should adopt pro-natalist policies to close the baby gap and arrest a spiral of even fewer workers supporting even more retirees. And the article continues that even the usually sober economist recently warned about the vanishing Japanese. So we've been getting some press on, on these issues, and Stephen, who's written this book, is joining us here today to talk about his book and some of his thoughts. As you know, he's a professor of National Security Studies at the National Defense University, a position he's held since 1992. And he, from 1996 to 2002, was a senior policy advisor to the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, where he focused on on long-term issues and France. And in the spring and summer of 2011, he was a public policy scholar here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, where he worked on this book and um, completed it. So Stephen, welcome. Delighted, delighted to have you here. And I actually wanted to start um, the discussion by talking a little bit about the focus of the book. And in, in the introduction, you really set this up by saying this topic is related to so many other topics. You say the question of low birth rates lies at the intersection of many of the great themes of human existence on both the personal and national levels. So all the small questions, the meaning of life at a time when sexuality has been separated from procreation, the reinterpretation of the role of children in a society where they are no longer an economic necessity, the tension between individual preferences for small families and the social need for replacement level fertility, the impact on children of being brought up in non-traditional families or of spending less time with their parents and more in child care, in child care the blessings and curses of longevity, and the relationship between population and power. 
So lots of connections, lots of big topics. You say that the study would be incomplete if it ignored these themes, but it would also become unmanageable if it did not focus. So tell us, what's the focus of your book? Well, the focus of the book um, is whether government policy can make a difference. Um, and it, you know, those questions are really wonderful questions, and it was painful you know, not to be able to discuss them all. Um, but I did attempt to, to answer to my own satisfaction, I hope some of yours, whether governments can make a difference in arresting the uh, decline of birth rates in advanced societies. I want to say, you know, by way of preference, pre preface and preference, that it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, the center um, gave me uh, a wonderful opportunity to research and think and meet some people, became good friends. Um, gave me a chance to write part of this book. And then, you know, thanks to Joe Brindley, other people, uh, it helped to publish the book. And so I feel a sense of completion, Roger Malkin, being here and being able to talk about it at this particular place, and a sense that, you know, I wish I was still here, frankly. Uh, <laughs> so. I, I heard one of your friends say, this is the only way I'll get you to sign my book, your book. This is why I came That's today. completely untrue. <laughs> Slander, you, you know. So, um, uh, Stephen, in looking at the book, I know that you very specifically wanted to talk about um, low birth rate as, as a national security program uh, problem. And you talk about this in terms of four dimensions. You talk about a smaller number of working age people will need to care for a mushrooming population of seniors. That's the first point you make. The second is you talk about um, losing young people and sort of losing the possibility for change, new ideas, and innovation. The third point you make is to talk about um, the, the question you ask is, can rich but aging societies survive in a world in which they constitute a small and declining percentage of total world population? And then finally, you raise the, the question of immigration. And what does that mean? Could you talk a little bit more about this, this connection for you with low birth and national security? Well, I think you've done a very good job in summarizing it by taking my own words, which probably are better uh, uh, than anything I can tell you verbally. Um, but I think the point is um, that w we have a fairly unique um, moment in, in the history of the world because um, there's never been a time when you know, people have voluntarily produced fewer children than is necessary for you know, sustaining the population. Um, and that's, that's the thing which has made the last 100 years really different. And that means I'd like to go back to this key concept of the demographic transition. Um, when you write a book on low birth rates and declining population, um, which, by the way, the people in that article on April 4th defined all these books as alarmist. Do I look <laughs> alarmist? Well, um, um, yeah, I look alarmist, all right, well, um, it's probably because of the weather. So the, um, the uh, reason is that, that we've heard a great deal for a long time about overpopulation. I don't mean, only mean Thomas Malthus, but, you know, in the last 50 years, overpopulation has been seen as a huge thing. So the idea of having a book or books that talks about the, the declining birth rate seems in a way absurd. Um, if you see these as two completely independent trends having nothing to do with each other, then people say, well, why, why do you want to deal with declining population? They have too many people in other parts of the world. Well, the thing is that there is the concept of the demographic transition that, that helps to explain the relationship between these two things. That they're not two separate things. They're part of one big trend. I think that's the key point. Um, and what happened was that the world always had high birth rates and high mortality. People had a lot of babies and most of them died. And somehow or other, more or less, we managed to sustain a population that didn't grow very much for a very, very long period of time. And that was the history 
um, until the 19th century. In the 19th century, something changes. Um, demographers aren't 100 percent sure, but probably public health improved nutrition and then eventually modern medicine and mortality rates decline uh, in Europe, beginning the 19th and even more at the end of the 19th century. And then suddenly a lot of children live longer and you have a, a real growth in the population. Europe goes from being maybe 5 percent of the population of the world to 25 percent of the population of the world. And then eventually people take into account the fact that, you know, they don't need that many children, that what children are surviving and they begin to have fewer and they begin to use techniques of contraception. And so that happens uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. In the meantime, many of these people were absorbed into the Industrial Revolution or they come here or they go to South America, or they go to the, the colonies. Um, the same thing happens in Asia. Um, after World War II, the birth rate in Japan was five or six children. This falls precipitously. And of course, Jap what happens though as populations decline in Europe and in Asia is they don't stop at the magical number of 2.1, which is what guarantees you know, a sustainable population. Now, and, and that's sort of the problem that deep down we all think the universe makes sense. Um, you know, there are laws of, you know, Adam Smith creates laws of the economic universe, and that they're somehow rather when the, the birth rate will decline and go to a sustainable level, but it doesn't, it just keeps going down, in many cases, to a very, very low level. And that's the problem which presents itself in Europe um, in the 1930s. And that's when the issue of do you do something about low birth rates becomes a real issue at the time. But, but isn't um, population and world population still increasing? And, and if so, so why, why is it important to talk about the dangers of declining birth rates? You talk about this moment in time. Well, because, you know, we don't have a completely global society. Um, the world is not like the United States is. If you have too many people in one state and not enough jobs, people move around. But the world is still composed of states and nation states. And um, you can't just have vast numbers of people move easily from one place to the other. Well, I mean, immigration is an important thing. Most of the time, much of the time, it's a very useful thing. But if that immigration is on too large a scale, it's hard to absorb people in society. And the political consequences of immigration are really huge, especially, for example, at the time of the Great Recession. Look at how Europeans are reacting to what, in fact, is very little immigration. They're reacting by voting for the extreme right. When European elections take place the next month, it's going to be pretty awful. So there are limits to how you can solve the problem of immigration. Meanwhile, um, uh, societies, uh, advanced societies, may find they really have too few people. Um, and, uh, and that's why it, it makes sense to, to try to think about how you can uh, um, have a, a modest improvement in birth rates in, in, in advanced societies. Japan would be an extreme case because there the population is going to go down very quickly um, because they don't allow in any immigration. So, um, Stephen, I, I shared the book with a friend and a colleague, Jennifer Davs Scuba, who is an assistant professor in international studies at Rhodes College in Memphis. And, and she really liked the, the book and felt that it was something that she could use um, in the classroom with her students. And, and one of the questions that she asked me to, to convey to you was saying that you talk about the major implications of low fertility or for national security. How did you go about choosing the five states that you decided to focus on? And why not choose countries with low fertility, but which are more central? to global security, like Russia, China, the UK, and even the US. So why, why did you choose these five states, and why not other states that may be more central to this question, the questions around security? I'd rather turn the question around and make it sort of like the argument by design. What was the, 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 the deep and profound reasons why the author chose these 
these, um, we could throw it up for discussion. Um, in reality, I mean, there's a certain amount, um, there's a certain amount of planning and there's a certain amount of serendipity and there's also the problem of travel budgets. Um, <laughs> well, what I wanted to do, um, I wanted to include some countries which had successful policies in raising the birth rate and some countries which had failed or hadn't really tried. And I wanted to have some kind of geographical spread because I want to include both Europe and Asia. And for me that was very important because, you know, like most European historians who I grew up in a relatively Eurocentric world and I've written a lot on Europe. And I felt that the, import, the great need to break out of that because this is a topic which is global and you had to talk about Asia. So it was a really great thing to deal with two Asian countries. It's something which was a, a real pleasure for me. Um, France and Sweden were obvious choices. Those are two examples of countries that had successful uh, programs for different reasons. Um, Japan, the third largest economy in the world, obviously very, very important case. Singapore, because it's it's a small country that's a terrific laboratory for any kind of political phenomena. And Italy, because, well, why Italy as opposed to some other country? Well, it's an advanced society. You know, I more or less can get through Italian, some very wonderful writing on Italy. And, you know, I had enough money to go to France and Italy, but, you know. And China and Russia don't fit into my categories, which is advanced societies. Russia, what Russia is, is hard for me to define. And China is certainly it's not just an advanced society, it's also a developing society. So I figured that, you know, Italy worked out okay. And uh, I had the benefit of talking to some really terrific demographers there, and that really helped. So it was good to see that you were actually able to go out and have these very meaningful uh, conversations with some key demographers and, and policy planners. Any anecdote or story really sticks out to you in those conversations that you had? Well, if, I, I think that um, if you don't see a place, if you don't go there, um, you, you can't write about it. Um, with the exception of the ancient world where it's difficult to visit it. Um, but I mean, you, you, some things really come out that, um, for example, in Singapore, um, unless you've actually spent some time there and see what it means to live there, to be a parent, um, the daily rhythm of life, um, the fact that people work late, that they take the subway to the someplace, some 20-story high-rise on the edge of the island, um, that you, you realize that they, and they likely to eat their dinner at a food court before they go home. <laughs> you ask yourself, how do children fit into that? Um, one of the people who was Secretary General of the Committee on Population uh, was nice enough to take me to her house, and she showed, you know, again, the 20 stories, and she showed me with pride the playground. There was a little playground in the courtyard of this huge complex. Um, and you can hardly imagine what it would be like for a child to be playing there. Um, this is not a place that you can physically, you can imagine it easy to be a parent and easy to be a child. Um, so, I mean, just seeing that, I think, um, was a profoundly important thing, understanding, you know, why there's a low birth rate in Singapore. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite taken with the, with um, your stories around France. I know you have have had some time there yourself. My wife is French, mm, okay. um, so here am I, a Caribbean American person, married to a French woman, and when we started having our children. Um, we were encouraged by the French government to continue having these French citizens of Franco-Caribbean American heritage living in Washington, D.C., and we would get financial um, benefits mm, really? for having children mm. here. So mm. the, the, the Francis policies reach out um, far and wide. Mm. 
In, in looking at your book, um, Jen Scuba said that the book is an excellent description of pro-natalist policies, both background and content, in five very interesting and very different cases. I found the description of the influence of the Catholic Church in Italy particularly interesting. I could foresee using this book in my population and natural security courses to help students understand some of the pronatalist policy background in low fertility societies. So the book is a welcome addition to our political demography field. Could you talk a little bit more about the influence of the Catholic Church in Italy? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting because the influence of the church is not what you might think. Um, because in terms of affecting people's sexual life, um, that influence is almost negligible. Um, people don't follow the church's dictates. They use contraception, one fashion or other. They have very, very few children. Um, so it's clear that the message of the church isn't, um, isn't being followed with one exception that, that in Italy children are almost entirely within wedlock, which is very different from France or Sweden. I'm, we could talk about that mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, um, the church's influence politically is very strong. Mm, some people have even argued that its influence is greater now than it was in the old days. You know, in the old days in Italy, in the previous republic, the days when Christian democracy was the dominant party and the, and the Communist Party was the main opposition, um, Christian Democrats had a huge power. They held the government most of the time. Um, so you might think with the end of that, um, the church's role would have declined, but not really because now there are people on the left who also come out of a kind of Catholic uh, political culture. And so they have support on both sides of the aisles. Um, in a system which is really dysfunctional most of the time, um, when it's hard to pass legislation, um, the church adds a big dimension in opposing any kind of programs that make it easier for women to work and have children, especially things like daycare, preschool kind of thing. Um, and that way they hope that they will maintain the traditional family. Um, well, the result is that it's much harder for women to work and have children. Um, with the result that although the traditional family survives, the birth rate is really, really low. And there's the paradox. You know, conservatives have always wanted to defend the traditional family. But where you have a traditional family relatively intact, uh, the father working, the mother at home, the birth rates are lower than in countries like Northern Europe, where women work and also have more children than in Italy. So, you know, there, one of the things that's wonderful about this research is, you know, if you go in, you know, as an outsider, um, you, fought, you learn a lot. There are a lot of paradoxes about this. Uh, and that's what makes it such a fascinating uh, subject to study. So let's talk about France and Sweden. Okay. Why, why did they um, become involved in developing a mm -hmm. pro-natalist government policy? Okay. Well, I'll start with Sweden. Um, uh, in Sweden, um, by the 1930s, the birth rate was the lowest in Europe. It was about 1.7 children below the level of sustainability. Um, well, the, the debate at that time was the usual debate where, you know, people who were on the left had basically said it's not a big problem, and people on the right said, aha, what's the problem? It's the new woman, as it were. Um, it's those women who are non-traditional going to work, you know, contraception, all those terrible things, threat to the traditional family. Uh, so the debate was, more, was not a very, very wonderful debate, not a very rich debate. Um, when um, the Great Depression hit Europe, um, the Swedish Social Democrats came to power. I think that there are few parties in, in modern history that have shown the the real political genius of the Social Democrats. I mean, they had seen, you know, democratic states in Europe overrun by fascism. They saw the collapse of Germany, the SPD's deplorable performance. Uh, 
Austrian socialists unable to resist the, the fascism. And they realized that the same thing could happen in Sweden. So they came up with a set of new ideas, which ideas that would later be called Keynesian, but they were developed by their own, their own people. Um, and so they turned around the economic crisis. Um, as I point out in my book, one of the people um, who was a, a, young, a relatively young intellectual who came up with some new theories about economics was Gunnar Myrdal. Um, and he and his wife um, were very interested in population issues. In 1935, they wrote a, a book together on the population crisis. And they managed to convince the Social Democrats that this was an issue that had a vital impact on the future of Sweden. The Prime Minister Hansen said, population is the most important problem facing the country today in 1935. And so Myrdal sees economic development and population as part of a whole. And that, I think, is one reason that he manages to convince the government that something needs to be done. And so they pass some legislation, for example, maternity leave, the right to return to a job for women if, after they're pregnant, that kind of stuff. They have a lot of other ideas. It's not too late that those ideas are developed, but the basic concepts that underlie all modern thinking on this are developed by Myrtle. And the, here, here's what they are. One, that um, society has to make it possible for women to reconcile work and family. If you can't do that, women are not going to have children. Two, children are very expensive, and they make families poor. And therefore, um, if you want to have children in a society, the government, the state, has to develop a kind of horizontal redistribution where people with fewer children help provide the funds for people with more. The, the government has to provide funding um, for families with children. And you have to have housing an education that's appropriate so these children develop well. Um, and you have to have programs which are not monetary programs, not giving people money, but social programs like preschool, um, which take care of children and help them assimilate into the society and develop educationally. Um, and so Myrdo, the Myrtles come up with these ideas, and they're all at the basis of probably modern thinking. Um, the war takes place. The baby boom takes place, and you don't really have to worry about population for a while. And then birth rates fall again. And then these ideas become the basis for the Swedish system, which is a, a logical system that, that basically takes care of the insecurity uh, which surrounds most women and most families with, with having children, which I think many people in this room have experienced firsthand. I know <coughs> I certainly did as a father. Um, you know. A year maternity leave paid, you know, almost fully salary, a right to return to a job within two and a half years, um, an excellent system of public preschool, and they stress the word as preschool rather than daycare because it's meant to be educational, and a system whereby, you know, it's very easy for men as well as women to take time off if their children are sick. And, and this creates a much less stressful experience in being a parent, and that's sort of keeps the birth rate up. No, it's not huge. It's a birth rate that you know, fluctuates to a bad sustainable to, to 1.7. But compared to much of the rest of Europe, it's, it's fabulous. Um, and so I think the main point here is the economic crisis was linked somehow in people's minds to the problem of birth rates. And, well, and that's what did it in Sweden. Now, France is completely different because France became involved in this because of national security in the most direct way. I mean, France had a very different experience from any other country in Europe because, you know, in Europe, as I said, when the demographical transition took place, most countries' birth rates remain the same, death rates rise, a huge demographic dividend, a lot of kids. Um, in France, as the birth rate, as the, as the death rate declines, the birth rate declines almost perfectly in tandem, with the result that the French population barely increases in the first half of the 19th century, and often deaths are greater than births in the second half of the 19th century. Well, 
from the point of view of some economists at the time, that's fine. It kept wages up and so on. The real reason people were doing it, I think, was largely that most people lived on the land. The revolution had divided property into small plots, and you couldn't support a lot of people. You could only have one son to really uh, take over the land. That may be the most important thing. Um, then comes 1870, the Franco-Prussian War. There's horrible defeat that, that frankly, nobody in France was prepared for. Um, and people were, at the time, said, aha, uh -huh. among the many reasons they advanced for the defeat was, you know, we once had a lot more people than anybody else, and now there are as many Germans as there are French. And the way things are going, there'll be a lot more Germans than there are French. In fact, in World War I, there were 50% more Germans than there were French. So it becomes a matter of national security. Something has to be done. And so you have a pro-natalist movement. But the movement didn't exactly have a great public relations approach. Because, um, I mean, you, know, tell, you can't say, tell women that they should have more children so that you can send them to the trenches so they can die fighting the Germans. That's really going to get women to have a lot of children. Um, and um, you were living in a, in a world of low tax government. And so there was no financial benefits that were offered. Uh, and people went around saying, well, you should, you should tell people if they don't have children, then they can't vote. If you don't have three children, you shouldn't be able to vote or hold office or have a public job. All of which was total nonsense because, you know, if most people had few children, they weren't going to vote for members of parliament who were going to cut their, um, raise their taxes or cut their salaries. It was nonsense. It wasn't until 1939, two months before the war started, that the government of the Third Republic under um, Deladier issues the Code de la Famille. And that is a transforming moment. They basically say, we will pay people more if they have children. Um, people's salaries will be, inc or wages will be increased based on the number of children they have. You'll get a tangible benefit to be able to afford having more children. And this was done, so July 29th, 1939, the end of the Republic. A few months later, you know, a year later, Vichy. And Vichy, for his own crazy reasons, supports this legislation um, for different reasons. And then de Gaulle and the resistance come to power, and they, and they preserve it, but they go a step further, which is, I think, the essence of what French policy became. Um, after World War II, there was a, and during the resistance, there was a genuine attempt to understand what went wrong. And they linked together the stalemate society, as it was called, the lack of economic growth, the lack of economic dynamism, the fact that it was run by old people, the fact that France had fallen behind Germany in industrialization, and they linked it to Malthusianism, not enough children. And therefore, they said, we have to break from this mold. And that leads to the Monet plan. You know, the French government will plan economic growth, and it leads to demographic planning as well. The measures that are necessary to create population growth are instituted in France um, under very, very well-known people. It becomes a real focus for government, and a lot of money will be spent in France uh, to make it possible for women to, and to have cho children and for families to be able to afford children. And in the first round, it's the traditional family, more money for the father who's working, the mother at home. That becomes indefensible by the 1960s when women are working. And under the Gaullists, it's turned around so that w working women actually get more of the benefits. Um, and so France develops this robust system of support for families, which and about 4% of the gross national product is spent for families in both France and Sweden. And these policies are extremely successful. And they become iconic. Nobody in France really, you know, wants to touch them. Um, the, so that's how those two countries manage to come up with models. Well, these models are not unique. I mean, Scandinavia more or less has a motto. Most countries are sort of like the Swedish. The French, um, the French are sort of unique. Um, in Southern Europe, more or less follows, is like Italy, very big problems with birth rates. Spain, you know, Italy, 
Greece, all the southern countries have very low birth rates. And the great exception, the really puzzling case, is that Germany has one of the lowest birth rates in Europe. A and, um, um, and that's another issue that we could talk about later if you want. So uh, thinking of Japan, Italy, Singapore, mm -hmm. why did they fail? Um, there are, that's a, a complicated question because naturally they fail for different reasons. But one of the th reasons is that um, it's a question of timing. I believe that the policies which have been effective um, to palliate the decline of birth rates uh, have to do with the welfare state. It's, they're part of the welfare state. Now, the welfare state had its rise after World War II, and it began to decline in the 1970s. So countries which started this early on, like France and Sweden, they, these policies developed and grew and crested with the welfare state. But what happened if the problem wasn't recognized too much later? Well, in the case of Italy, the Italians had a high birth rate. In, in the, these years, the birth rate was, was, was pretty, you know, above 2.1. And it's not till after the welfare state already is in trouble that the Italians begin to realize we have a problem with birth rates. The same thing is true in Japan. Um, and so the question of timing of when your birth rate begins to really go down, um, that's a very important factor. Um, the role of the church, as I said, church um, is an important factor against developing pronatalist policies. Um, third thing that's really interesting is where you were in World War II, um, the Axis states, every single one of them, had promoted people going and having children for the fatherland. You know, the Germans, you know, telling their people, at least the ones who were Aryans, to have children and killing off some of the others. Um, Japan, you know, go out and have children for the empire and the colonies and all that. And Italians, the same thing. That one of the dumbest things that Mussolini did was to tell the Italians who had been coming to this country for decades because of overpopulation in Italy, thereby providing my wife's family with, with the chance to come to America, for which I'm forever grateful. Um, I mean, Mussolini said the Italians needed more children rather than fewer. So the intervention of government for pronatalism, and sometimes for eugenics, um, means that people in those countries don't want the government to meddle with issues. And so those countries that were access states or were somehow rather, well, like Spain, sort of, you know, sort of honorary access states, um, the role of government is seen still in a very, very negative way or, or it becomes an alibi for a dysfunctional government doing nothing. Like in, I think in Italy it's more of an alibi. So that's another factor. Um, um, social values. I mean, can you tolerate the notion of gender equality? I mean, are you willing to accept the fact that gender equality matters? I mean, if you really don't, if you really hate the idea of gender equality, then there are going to be no policies at work. Um, Japan isn't really comfortable with gender equality. Um, there's le legislation on the books, and it doesn't really amount to very, very much. I mean, it's not followed. Um, so I think that is a, an important factor. And another factor, which is sort of a complicated one, is if you, if you really insist that the only appropriate place for childbirth is in marriage, and if the benefits of government policies are restricted to families, um, then that makes it more difficult because half the births in Northern Europe and, and France are out of wedlock. And so, in a sense, you know, you have the paradox that if you make it possible to give support to all children, whether they're born in wedlock or not, if the family, if the state becomes agnostic about the family, um, then in some ways you're helping to increase the population, but you're making a choice that the family is not as indispensable as all that. And that, that's one of the great issues I didn't touch in this book because it's a big issue and I'm, 
no, I only had six months here. So. <laughs> um, and I, I, but it, it's a it's a very very serious one. Um, Well, I didn't define it in any brilliant way. I mean, um, well, what I'm what I'm saying is that the the definition of family that I was using was based on marriage. But then, of course, you have you have cohabitation in um, in northern Europe and in France, where again half the births are in in cohabitation. By cohabitation, we mean something which is people actually living together. And taking responsibility for their relationship to the and child, huh? And state well, in some countries, yeah, yeah. So that's a factor. Yes, it's definitely a factor. So marriage um, is not necessary. In in countries where that's the case, in Sweden, for example, um, people file their income tax individually. There's no such thing as a family income tax like we have in the United States. So the financial, there are no financial benefits, whatever, to being married. So they handled the issue of the family in a very different way from us. The word family is funded. The word family is, is, um, has to be seen flexibly. And in addition, one thing I learned from this is that you know, when people talk about the traditional family, it usually means something that goes back to around World War II, um, that we use the term most of the time not knowing what we're talking about. Um, because the, cha the family, for example, in Japan, Japan has gone through several forms of family in the last century. And what does it mean to talk about the traditional Japanese family? It's a meaningless thing. Um, so I think that that's an area that I didn't want to get into very much, of course. So uh, sort of building off of this conversation, you think of the, the lessons from France and Sweden. What, what implications um, are, do you derive from having looked at these case studies that could be applied today? Well, what I did, if you read this, I mean, I want to take away the surprise. Um, by the book. By the book. Well, <laughs> the, the, what, I, what you have to conclude is that policies like those followed by France and Sweden succeeded, past tense, in dealing with the decline of birth rates. They worked, past tense. You're asking me another question, which is, of course, the question I raised in the book. Can such policies work today? Well, the problem is, it's maybe not whether such policies can work today, but whether such policies can be funded today. Um, because at a time when, you know, neoliberalism is so strong, where the welfare, where government is doing less rather than more, where there's a lot of many people who think that government should spend less money, do you find the money to do the same kind of thing in countries which don't have those policies? I mean, for example, just for the sake of argument, a country called the United States of America. Um, you know, we had uh, um, high birth rates for a long time for a variety of reasons. And I'm not, I'm not a specialist on America. And I'm not speaking in any authoritative way. Um, uh, one reason was um, I think we got by cheap because of the American dream, um, the notion that, well, the next generation is going to be better off than this generation. And therefore, you know, you sacrifice for your children a little bit, but it's going to work out. So, so long as you believe that the next generation will have it better than us, but what if you no longer do? Um, what if you have this sneaking suspicion that it will be worse for them? And then maybe the willingness to, to work really hard at the expense of your own standard of living to bring children into the world, maybe that becomes a little bit more questionable. Maybe you only have one child and invest the resources you have not to promote social mobility, but to prevent social mo the de decline of, s of, of status. Um, well, the, the thing is, how, realistically, how realistic is it to think the United States in the near future will have one year of paid maternity leave? I mean, to suggest that would be communist. Hmm? Hmm? To suggest that the United States should fund one year of maternity leave, like the Swedes do. 
In other words, I don't think this is a moment where, where, this, where the policies that worked in, the, in, in France and Sweden can easily be applied today, which raises the question then, if not that, then exactly what? Now, we also know that the birth rate in this country is declining. It's not that high among whatever you want to call them, white Native Americans or something like that, but it's also declined among Hispanic immigrants. Um, so although we haven't faced the problem and we have a lot of immigration, even in the United States, um, the, the actual American population of American citizens is no longer way above the sustainable level. Um, so I mean, I think that the question is beginning to be raised. In an economic crisis like the one we've had for the last six or seven years, birth rates fall anyway, and this crisis isn't quite over. So, I mean, can you apply those policies? Um, and I'm not sure that, that we can pay for them or will pay for them. Mm -hmm. I think an even better question is whether the countries that have successful policies will be able to continue to fund them. And so that is a source of concern, not alarmism, no, but concern. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, so Stephen, I want to sort of build on that and talk a little bit more about the implications for your your evidence for other countries. And and in talking to um, Halle Esfandiari, who's the director of the Middle East program here, her, her reaction to your book, and once again, she's looking at it from a Middle East perspective, and specifically thinking of Iran. Mm. So I'll send you, send you, and be focusing. I want to talk a little bit about yeah. contraception. Yeah. Now, in the role of contraception. So her, her message to me, and I'll, I'll, I'll read this short email, follow the example of Iran, cut off family planning budget, criminalize vasectomy, criminalize abortion, impose heavy fines of any kind on advertisements favoring birth control, impose restrictions on women's access to a number of fields of higher education, give monetary awards to families who have more than two children, keep the age of marriage at 13 for girls, mm. dot, dot, dot. Mm. They still didn't succeed. Mm. And another colleague of mine, Kaya Jusenska from Population Action International, also took mm. up this, this idea when she mm. had a look at your book. And, and she wanted to know how can we think about your evidence to neutralize current and future punitive measures against contraception? Mm. How do you see these questions mm. coming up as you think about these issues? Well. I think that um, in the case of Iran, without knowing this firsthand, I think the, as it were, the train has left the station. Once women know how to deal with uh, uh, contraception, um, even the wise dictates of, you know, of Khomeini is not, are not going to change their mind. They will manage to practice it. Um, and I'd, I'd like to point out that um, if you have to resort to it, um, 19th century French peasants were perfectly capable of controlling population without any artificial contraception. The old techniques, if not much fun for the men, worked just fine. So I don't, I mean, I think if there's no way you're going to tell people. You know, we're going to force you to have children. It's nonsense. It's just nonsense. Um, it can happen. Now, I think it's different if you have a country that has very high birth rate and you're just beginning to educate women about techniques of contraception and, and the government stops doing that. That's different. But once a country has reached the levels of Iran, I don't think the government mm -hmm. can do anything. And I think it only makes the regime look silly. You know, these are things that people really care about. And I think that it's always dangerous in a society to tell people to do things that they absolutely won't do. It destroys the credibility of the regime and destroys any sense that these people are wise or thoughtful or understanding. I mean, it's a very bad, just like parents making ridiculous and impossible rules for their children. They destroy parental authority. And that's, I think, what the regime would do. So I mean, they're only going to be victims of their own policies. Okay. 
So I want to talk, you talk a little bit um, in the book, you make mention of the, the idea of the demographic dividend mm -hmm. and how you capitalize on this. And this is something that, that those of us in the demographic community talk about a lot with regard to Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, how can they think about capitalizing on the demographic mm -hmm. dividend. So you, you seem to imply that if we th want to mitigate the consequences of low fertility in the future, we have to think about facilitating a demographic dividend, but also think about creating a strong social welfare-oriented state now. So, you know, it seems to me that there's some sort of order of operations that's complex and to be thinking about. Any thoughts in that regard? How, how could we be thinking about how to manage these order of operations? What's the role of the state? How to capitalize on a demographic dividend? Oh, let me say one other thing. I forgot to mention, I never told you to mention, that anything I say is not meant to reflect the opinions of the National Defense University, the <laughs> Department of Defense, the United States government, and, and I don't guarantee they reflect my own opinions either, but that's another <laughs> Duly no, noted. Please. I, I, uh, I saw that in the book. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, the, um, uh, the, demo, the demographic dividend was a situation like you had let's say in 19th century Britain. Um, a lot more children being born and living, joining the workforce. And the good luck was, just at that moment, lo and behold, somebody invented the Industrial Revolution and the steam engine and the factory. And suddenly you had a lot more people who could work in this industrial plant. And you had a growing population, which probably meant more consumers, sort of. Um, and then eventually that birth rates went down, and, but that, de that bonus, as it were, helped drive industrialization. So at best, that happens. Um, not so good, but acceptable is a place where you have a lot of people, but you don't have an industrial revolution, and you don't have new jobs. And well, when that works well, they find a nice place to go, like coming to America. Swedes in the late 19th century, a lot of people, Englishmen, Germans, came to America, and that worked out really fine. Um, what's not so good is when you have a growing population, a lot of young people, and there's precisely nothing for them to do in their country because their economy is in free fall or it's a failed state or something like that. And, it, you know, and then it, you may have find a situation where there's no place for them to go. Nobody wants, well, how many more Pakistanis do we have now than we did? In tens of millions of Pakistanis, the population is burgeoning. Where are they going to go? And so that is a recipe for disaster. And there are many countries which, which have very high birth rates and resources collapsing. Yemen. Mm. Yemen is a great example, and it's a country my wife has spent time in and loves. Oil is on the way out. There won't be any oil in a few years. There won't be any oil. It's over. Water is disappearing. Uh, and the birth rate is, you know, five or six. You know, what happens to Yemen? Um, and so there's, you know, that's not a place where there's going to be any demographic dividend. The best thing you can hope for is, is a rapid decline in birth rates. If I were the government in those countries, I would do my best to teach people had a, you know, the techniques of prophylaxis really fast, mm -hmm. but these in many cases are failed state type places or, or precarious governments. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the problems really lie. So a couple quick questions and I'd like to open it up for, for discussion. So I'm, I'm glad to, to hear you mention oil and water. Um, and instead of thinking on the global development framework and the emergence of and continuing discussions around global sustainable development goals, w what do you see as some of the linkages between low birth rates and, for example, connections to climate change? Is it a good, are there dangers to us talking about this right now at a time when we see the negative impacts of climate change? Well, what I said in the beginning and in the very end of my book is that anything I say has to be reconsidered in terms of the problem of climate change. I mean, you'd have to be 
crazy to write a book on population, and one that talks about the importance of maintaining a stable population without taking into account the impact of climate change. What well, the problem is, the problem is that I wrote this book um, as, as broadly as I could, but looking at it pretty much from the point of view of maintaining stable societies. And the assumption was, the working assumption that, that the world could deal with continued growth of population to, you know, till a few dec you know, some decades from now, the high growth countries began to have a fall in their birth rate. Um, but the point is that this may not be the case um, if cl as climate change goes on rapidly. Now, the most recent UN report that was mentioned just a few weeks ago about how the notion that, that you could maintain agricultural production at the same level, even in greater level, greater level um, with climate change is not, may not be the case that, in fact, production will fall. If production falls, it becomes harder to sustain the existing population. So what I'm basically, what I'd like to say is that, I mean, my main point um, to you is um, I've tried to raise an issue. There are three things that I think are important to think about that would be great research projects, but to do these research projects requires collaboration of people from different disciplines. I mean, I find it's, it's beyond my ability to think them out myself. One of the problems is what, is what do societies look like when they depopulate? Um, what is it going to look, what would Japan look like, for example, when there are 25 million or 50 million fewer Japanese? We know what shrinking cities are like. We have shrinking cities, but they're shrinking cities like Detroit because of the collapse of an industrial base, but not because there are fewer people in the United States. What, ha what, it, what happens, what is a society like? How does it function with a lot fewer people, but the same infrastructure and so on? Um, and then the second question is, well, in this post-welfare state era, um, how can one come up with viable policies that may make it possible for women to have the n a number of children they want, not the number of children the state wants, the number of children they want, which has tended to be much higher than the number they can actually have? And the third question, the most important in many ways, is <coughs> how do we figure out the trade-offs between this question and the question of climate change. Um, this is immensely complicated, but I think that is going to be the most important issue we face. Now, I don't have the answers, but I, I, I think that's the question. Mm -hmm. So my, my, my last question before we open it up, you know, your work has, uh, this book has been described as alarmist. Some others say it a little, some say it's a little bit more measured and less alarmist than some of the work that has emerged around aging. Um, and, and very often it's easy to forget that sort of a key component around low fertility and population aging is a very successful human, human success story. So w what are your thoughts on how your work and, and the book can help us talk about sometime, about the, the harmful messages around aging and, and sort of alarmist messaging around that. How do you position your work within that context? Well, um, I would say that before people who claim to be scholars use terms like alarmist, they might do well to read the book. <laughs> I know it's, it's tedious in this electronic age to actually read a book, but before you describe it it's and characterize bad. it, maybe you it's should. It's easy to read. Um, I mean, yeah, and it's, and it's short. It's easy um, to read. So, I mean, I think that that's, I mean, uh, if you read that article, which really burned me up, it eventually goes back to Theodore Roosevelt, as if all of us who are concerned about this are somehow rather taking up the white man's burden. I mean, it's like n nonsense. And then the guys come up with a conclusion which is almost exactly the same as mine. Yeah. In that article, yeah, it's 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 um, but you know that's you like, no, because it because it just came out. I haven't had a chance, but mine came out before, and, and I didn't write about their book, right? Uh, I, I, um, what it what's in? You, um, it, you have the the name of the yeah. Thing? I'll have to look and get it. I'll get it. Yeah. Anyway, no, I will I will read it, um, 
and, and, and anyway, negative idea in scholarship is like in politics. Better, you know, to be accused by your opponents in politics of having done something terrible. At least you get your name and, and you worry. So, I mean, it's not, it's not the worst of all things. Um, um, yeah, we can. This is, um, it's an article that appeared in the New York Times, an opinion piece. It's called Bye Bye Baby on April 4th. But the authors have just Tuttlebum written. Tuttlebaum and yeah. Jay Winter. Yeah, they've just written the yeah. book. Um, well known yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it doesn't change. Yeah. Yeah, but they should still watch what they say. Yeah. I'm not saying the book is wrong. I'm saying that the, the episode the is wrong. The conclusion on your book. You know? Yeah. Right, so um, let's open it up. Um, so we are, uh, this is being recorded, it's, it's oh, being, why didn't you say it's that being before? webcast. Oh, well then I wouldn't have said anything I said. <laughs> Too late. So I'd ask you, as, as we come around with the microphone, please identify yourself and give your affiliation, and we'll take uh, probably two or three questions, have you respond, and then um, go again. So please, yes. My name is Lincoln Day. I'm a demographer. I've been a published demographer for, I think, now about 65 years. Hmm. Um, and you had me worried until about two minutes ago <laughs> uh, because you didn't show any recognition in what you said about the existence of limits, limits of uh, environmental and limits of uh, resources, limits of um, um, air, water, land, uh, and uh, I, I was very concerned about that. You also seem to have a, a, a rather limited view of the demographic optimum. I would suggest that there are three things, three characteristics of the optimum population, no matter what the resource base for that population is. I think one of these is low mortality. I take that as a good thing. Another one is an unchanging age and sex distribution. You want to get away from these peaks and troughs resulting from great changes in births or deaths or something of that sort. And the third, of necessity, because of the existence of limits, is zero growth rate. And so far, I haven't heard anything about that. Okay, you, great. but I haven't read the book. Um, on the other hand, I have written and researched myself for, as I say, some 60 years. Good, mm. good, good to have you here again, Lincoln. Well, yes. oh, so you, let's, you let's, take, yeah, let's take yeah, a few. Okay. So. Hi, I'm, I'm George Topic. I'm um, from National Defense University. Um, and I would be interested in your views on fertility, what you call the fertility trap and, okay. and that sort of critical mass, um, and you know, under, under the characteristic or under the term of choice these days, unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. um, what your thoughts are about that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And yes, please, right here behind you. Uh, my name is Matthew Feely. I'm formerly of the National Defense University and currently an adjunct uh, professor at uh, Columbia University in New York City. Um, I'm a big Stephen Kramer fan, <laughs> and uh, today's talk uh, reminded me why. Thank you. I thought it was a great presentation. But I, I do have one point that I'd like to uh, challenge you on, perhaps. Um, you mentioned that one of, one of the tenets or reasons for being concerned about uh, uh, decreasing population concerns a smaller working population having to support a, a mushroomed uh, senior, older uh, population. It seems to me that, and I'll try to make this brief, it seems to me that for any population, any working population to support a retired population, you have to have enough wealth generation to apply it to that retired population. And whether that wealth comes from a return on human capital or on real capital, machinery or whatever real capital might be, computing, et cetera, shouldn't matter. And so if a country is developing enough wealth, it should be able to support the retired portion of that population. And so I wonder if we are in a situation now where the productivity gains from 
real capital investment may be adequate to support the older retired group. That supporting that retired group is not a problem, no matter how small the working population might be. And I also wonder if Adam Smith really is alive here because with the decline of the working age population and the parallel decline in the need for labor due to the increased productivity of real capital, the two might actually be synthesized in a way that's quite healthy for society. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So um, a few questions to you um, on limits, sort of looking at the demographic optimum um, of population, low fertility trap, unknown unknowns, and thinking of productivity gains from real, um, real capital development. Um, let me deal with the last question first. And um, just mentioned, I don't know if anyone else here is a lover of, of silent cinema, but um, one of the great silent films was a film by René Claire called A Nous La Liberté. <laughs> and um, it, it's, um, I, mean, I recommend it's a work of art, um, but at the end of, um, the end of A Nous La Liberté, this factory is just cars and things are just being churned out of the factory, which is now totally automated. And all the workers are now sitting around fishing and having fun, with the exception of the two heroes who are real anarchists who, who decide that they want nothing to do with organized activities and they go on being bums. But I think, you know, at various times we thought about the possibility of a society that was so productive that human labor could be almost eliminated. And Matt is sort of touching on that. But you know, one of the problems is that um, that fantasy is always about an egalitarian society. And this one isn't. Less so. So who's going to support the people who are not the upper one-tenth of a percent? Um, it may, that may be a problem inherent in what you're saying. And then there's other things which are kind of labor intensive, like who takes care of old people, of whom there'll be a lot, a lot of old people. Who takes care of them? Uh, the Japanese are developing robots. Would you want to be taking care of a robot? Um, they're also developing sex robots, which is another story. I mean, would you want your golden years to be spent by having a robot taking care of you? I mean, and if not, then who are those people going to be? Well, are they going to be people imported from poor countries, paid low wages to look after, you know, old Japanese or Americans or... So, I mean, it, there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. Again, it's, it's one of the areas that has to be really investigated. I mean, I see this as a beginning of a study, not an end. I sort of did what I thought I could do with my, you know, my own background and so on, but, you know, I didn't answer the big questions. In terms of limits, um, look, I think uh, I spend at least some time every day thinking about this issue and thinking, if you asked me what is the most, and this is as a professor of national security studies, mind you, trying to, and this is on the record in this comment, if you ask me what's the biggest problem I think we face, it's not the traditional forms of conflict, it's climate change without a doubt. And so the problem is how you take this theme that I'm talking about, which is real. It's a genuine issue. The problem of decline of birth rates in advanced society is a genuine issue. But you can't consider it without taking into account things like climate change. Well, how do you do that? Um, and I am not capable of doing that myself at this point. But I would like to see enough, a few people were interested in doing that and people I could work with on that. That's sort of what I was hoping, one of the things I was hoping that would come from this book if people read it. Um, in terms of um, the question that, that George raised um, that I mentioned in my book, um, you know, one of the problems of, one of the problems of decline in birth rates, one of the big problems is that 
it's not as if, you know, at a given moment it's easy to say, all right, well, no more of that. We're going to now have, we're going to do something about it. We're going to, you know, restore, you know, the population. Because this guy Wolfgang Lutz, a Viennese demographer, came up with a wonderful idea of the, uh, the, the um, uh, low fertility trap. And he says that once in a given society, birth rates are low for an extended period, um, you almost guarantee that there will be a spiral down. And he gives three reasons for that. The first one is so incredibly obvious that it didn't strike me as a person who was not gifted in mathematics. And that is, that if you have people now who have fewer children, 20 years from now, there will be fewer people around who could be parents. And so as that process continues, you get fewer and fewer parents. Now, if to get, that means they would have to have not two children, but three children to restore the existing population, let's say, of now. Um, secondly, um, he says, um, we um, tend to have the number of children um, based on what we're accustomed to. If you come from a large family, you see that as the norm. If you come from a family with two children, you know, you're likely to think it's normal to have two children yourself. But as the number of, as the size of families decreases, your expectations of what a family should be decrease, and therefore there's a, a tendency to go in that direction. And then the third thing he says that I think is very, very important, says that there's an economic dimension of expectations. Do you feel that you can, you know, do you feel optimistic about the future? Do you feel that your children will live better, or at least as well as you do? And if you think so, then you probably will have more children. But if you really think that's not the case, then you probably won't. And I think that there's a feeling that's very prevalent today that things are not going to be that great for the next generation. Um, and therefore, it makes sense on a family basis um, not to have too many. And so you can consecrate your resources and energy in that one child managing to, to make it under adverse circumstances. So I see this is um, one of the really biggest issues connected with, with low birth rates that it perpetuates itself and it aggravates itself potentially. And so thank you. Great. Thank you. More questions, please. Yes, at the back. I'm Marty Dickinson from the Environmental Law Institute. Um, Stephen, uh, I'm not sure you said anything about this in your book or not, not in the part I read so far. Uh, what about the rising cost of higher education, the increasing demand that people have, recognition that people have of the importance of higher education for their kids, certainly in the United States, I'm sure all elsewhere around the world. Does the rising cost of higher education have have you, have you thought about that, and what role does that have? Marty, I, I have good news for you. Eventually, you're going to find reference to that in my book. <laughs> it's there. It's there somewhere. Um, well, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think that the increasing cost of higher education is a really big thing. Look, um, basically, um, what parents in developed societies or even developing societies have cared about has often been social mobility for their children. Um, I mean, it's a very strong force. Emile Zola, whom I quote in this book because I actually spent a fair amount of time reading a 1,000-page novel of Zola called La Fecondité. Um, he wrote this novel when he had heroically just written I Accuse during the Dreyfus Affair and hightailed it to England so he wouldn't be arrested by the French police. He, Zola is a really great man. The book is truly his, one of his least literary books, but it's a great book in terms of giving you a sense of why people had few children in 19th century France. It's an incredible documentary and how they try to avoid having children and how they aborted children, how they killed children, and how I mean, it's, it's, it's a very important document. Um, so I think that people at that time were in a society which 
wasn't growing, where the economy wasn't growing very fast, that was egalitarian in politics, but inegalitarian in its economy. Um, he said, under those circumstances, the desire for social mobility, which he called capillarité, capillarity, um, um, w becomes very, very strong. And people will do whatever they can, um, even in an extreme way to have only one child or so, one male child, and try to advance that. Well, you know, we've moved from a society that seemed to be expansive. Many of us here grew up in the best time in American economic history after World War II in vast expansion, and the future seemed boundless. Um, but few people now have the same degree of optimism about where we're going. And, you know, that's a terrible fact. You have to send your kid to a great college to make it in a world where you know, almost the Marxian world where people being, most people being pushed down. So the only chance of making it is to go to one of those really good colleges. Well, there's $250,000, $300,000. Who can afford that um, from the middle class? And how many can afford that three or four or five times? So much for the you know, big families for the educated middle class. And so I think the cost of college is a very, very big factor. It's in Japan, it's the same thing too, apparently. To get a kid ahead, they have to go to cram schools from elementary school on. Can you imagine that? I mean, I only had to go to Hebrew school, and that was bad enough, but cram schools? Um, um, and then the really good colleges, are ex it's even more expensive in the United States. And those are, the cost of education will be one of the factors that leads people to have fewer children. And that's a very important point, Marty. Thank you. Great. Additional? Comments, questions? Yes, please. Irene, Kyria Kopoulos, National Defense University. So this is a special treat. I read the book, and then you give a very inspiring presentation. But I'm an economist, so this is a great opportunity to ask you to you know, broaden your horizons. You talked about Alan's, uh, Adam Smith. So when I was reading the book, you know, I was thinking, this is all very much a preoccupation that cannot be thought of, but in a national context. So uh, birth rates are falling, but that makes sense. It's a national security issue from a national perspective. And I was thinking about this idea of you know globalization and what it might mean for the adjustment process. I visited a friend the other day, and um, she's uh, cared for in a rehabilitation center. Mm -hmm. You prophesized what I saw. So all the specialized help was from African countries. All right, so um, I understand the process sort of intellectually. We know what is happening. What I wanted to ask you was to think through, I mean, is the problem as acute, as big, as insurmountable? Um, if you place it in a sort of a global context, so I don't have anyone to care for me when I'm old, someone who lives in my area, but someone from the other side of the world will come. Is this different from the case where my brain scan is read by someone in India? I mean, of course I know there's a difference, but I'm talking about the adjustment process. You know, not from a national standpoint, US, French, Swedish, mm. but from the standpoint of an adjustment. Mm. This is the world we have made. This is the world we have been shaping through policies. So if you open it up, I mean, would you be equally concerned less, more? But thanks for really taking a very difficult topic and making so much of it. Well, I today. thought I was sort of gotten through the 
the hard questions, so thank you very much for <laughs> takes an economist and one of one's friends to. Um, look, I mean, you, you, you have pointed at, you know, one of the really big tensions. Of course, it's perfectly legal now to get your brain scans read in another country. Um, but driving over here, um, I was listening to NPR, and they had a, a program on that cheerful topic about what a deportation of immigrants. And it's yet, a, you, some of you may have heard this because you may have been driving the same time I was. And, you know, I put it on in the middle, and some guy who seemed to be a really decent guy, he owned a house, he was working, but he had some crime conviction for some drug related thing. And he was deported. And deported, you know, his family is here, he was deported back to Trinidad. It was almost impossible. Um, the long and short is, we're living in a country and a world where immigration is a very, very big issue. And people, most people in most countries don't want it. Now, I don't think they're probably right in not wanting it. But there's no way, circumstances being what they are, that the number of people who would be necessary to care for all the American old people who are going to be there or are going to be allowed into this country to do it. It's not going to happen. Um, we haven't, and um, the one place in the world that's gone beyond the concept of the nation state is Europe, but all the European nations have birth rates below 2.1. So a lot of good that's going to do. Um, you know, even people in Europe who have an alarmingly high birth rate, enough to scare their neighbors, you know, the Albanians have a birth rate of 2.1. <laughs> That's really scary. But I guess if you have a birth rate of 1.3, the Albanians are coming. But, you know, I mean, so I think we have a, the problem of the nation state, the problem of immigration, the problem of failings, they all come together. And of course, climate change will make this much worse as various places may become uninhabitable. And so, I mean, when you take this issue and you go just one step, you inevitably get involved in other issues um, and it becomes incredibly complex to decipher. So thank you, yeah. Great, well, thank you, Stephen. It's been a really fascinating and insightful uh, conversation. So the other population crisis, what governments can do about failing birth rates is available to you outside. Um, we here at the Woodson Center will write up a summary of this discussion today. So I'll encourage you to visit our blog, New Security Beat, to see uh, um, um, a, that summary. So thank you. Please join me in thanking Stephen. <laughs> I encourage you to step outside and have a look at the, um, the book and purchase well, a copy. Thank you, Roger. Thank that you. That was really fun. Thank you. That was, was nice. I appreciate your good question. Thank you. Okay.